Okay, this is part one of our lecture video series from Monday, March 13th, where we are going to compare what we know thus far about valence bond theory to molecular orbital theory. So how do these two bonding theories and models differ? Well, let's get into it. So let's review what we know about valence bond theory. So the first thing that valence bond theory does is it considers bonds as localized between one pair of atoms, where localized just means found in one space. So we've got our bonding electrons located in one specific region in the molecule that is between two atoms. Now that differs from molecular orbital theory in that molecular orbital theory treats electrons as being delocalized throughout the entire molecule, meaning that bonding electrons are dispersed throughout our molecule in molecular orbitals not simply bonding orbitals. Okay, valence bond theory. Valence bond theory states that a chemical bond is a result of either overlapping atomic orbitals or not, right? So we either see hybridization or we don't. And then the overlapping of those hybrids to create sp, sp2, and sp3 style hybridization. So we have things like the formation of Are sp hybrids and that it is the overlap of these hybrids that creates a bond wherein that overlap region contains a spin pair electron. That's kind of like in a nutshell what valence bond theory does. Contrast this uh, with the formation of orbitals according to molecular orbital theory. So we form, of course, molecular orbitals, which we call our bonding and non-bonding orbitals, of which there are two types. So this is a result of atomic orbitals combining on different atoms, where any kind of combo can be an additive combo or a subtractive combo, which is what leads us to our bonding and our anti-bonding molecular orbitals. And in valence bond theory, we can of course form sigma or pi bonds, where the difference between a sigma and a pi bond is that a sigma bond results in the head-on overlap of atomic orbitals and our pi bonds are caused by this side-on overlap. Whereas molecular orbital theory, yes, we do see this idea of sigma and pi come back. However, sigma and pi now is talking about the formation of molecular orbitals, which creates bonding and non-bonding interactions. Determining, determined based on what orbitals, be they bonding or not, are filled with electrons. So here we still have the formation of sigma from head-on linear combinations and pi from side-on linear combinations. But overall, these combinations generate our bonding and anti-bonding Now orbitals, instead of bonds, that electrons are placed within. And then valence bond theory relates to our Vesper theory in that this allows us to predict the shape of our molecule based on the number of groups that are found on the central atom. This just means that orbital orientation 
is equal to our molecular geometry. So for example, anytime we have sp2 hybridization, we know we're looking at a trigonal planar molecular geometry. And embo theory does not give us any kind of overall molecular geometry information, but rather what it allows us to do is it allows us to determine the location and arrangement of electrons in our molecules. So it places electrons in specific energetic and orbital arrangements. And as a result of this arrangement, we get to understand things like physical properties of the molecule, as well as even the stability of the molecule. So in valence bond theory, we are looking at this idea of bonds still being formed between two atoms as a result of their orbital overlap. And in molecular orbital theory, all atomic orbitals from all atoms are coming together to form these one big molecular orbitals which are a result of our linear combinations that form either sigma or pi bonding and antibonding orbitals. So we are going to continue with an example in our next video where we look at an application of MO theory by drawing what we call a molecular orbital diagram. And we're going to start with our simplest molecule, in my opinion, which is elemental hydrogen or H2 gas.